Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the front line with Joe and Joe, Joe Pasillo and Joe Resinello. And once more, dear brothers and sisters, let us go into the breach on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network, 1350 on your AM dial, 103.9 on your FM dial, spreading the truth of the Catholic faith to the New York City metropolitan area. Please download the app, share it with your friends. You'll have access to all of our station's content. Wherever you see Joe and I, please, on social media, uh, YouTube, X, Facebook, Rumble, uh, please like, subscribe, share, do all that fun stuff, especially if you like our content. If you like these interviews that we do, we go live on Thursday nights uh, at 9 o'clock mm -hmm. Eastern time where we get into a little bit more trouble than we get into here. Uh, so we would appreciate you help us, helping us to spread the word. And today we're welcoming back to the show a friend of the program, Anthony DiStefano, um, and we're going to be discussing his new book, The Story of the First Easter Bunny. You know what intrigues me is that we take so many things for granted. It's one thing, Anthony, in the time that Joe and I are doing this show, we get the real story behind things. So you think of like the, the Easter Bunny, but you actually wrote a book saying, oh, wait a minute, guys, here's where it comes from. <laughs> so, um, so we're glad you did that, Anthony. This book is uh, for everybody. Um, the book is available at Sophia Press. If you click the link in the description, uh, you could get a, a modest discount, all right, uh, because you're uh, going to be getting that from uh, through Joe and Joe. So, uh, Anthony DiStefano, welcome back to the front line with Joe and Joe. Well, thank you so much for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. You know how much I love being on your program. I always tell you the truth. I always say you guys are the best interviewers around, and I mean it. No, no flattery and no lie. Thank you so much, Anthony. We really appreciate it. And just for those of you out there, and Anthony's been all over the place. Many of you have seen him. Uh, but just in case, Anthony DiStefano is an American author, television host, and activist. He has written five best-selling Christian books for adults, including A Travel Guide to Heaven and Ten Prayers God Always Says Yes To. He's also written 16 best-selling books for children, including The Donkey That No One Could Ride and Little Star. So we encourage you all to look up. Anthony, you have a personal website, right, that people could go to to buy your books also? Well, they can go there. I don't sell my own books. I let the publishers do that and the distributors do that. But my website is www.anthonydestefano.com. And you could find all my books and more about me there if your listeners don't uh, mind my long Italian name. I know that, that that's okay. They don't mind us, so I'm sure they don't. Okay, mind you. the plus. Um, yeah, and so and we and as I always say on the show, please, we not only want to support our Catholic authors, but also our Catholic publishers. And hey, if you have a, a, a parish bookstore and they're not stocking Anthony's books, why don't you tell them to order a few, put them on the shelf? I guarantee they're going to sell like hotcakes. Joe Resinello. Anthony, we always begin with a prayer to Our Lady in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, never was it known that anyone who sought your help or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly into you, a virgin of virgins, our mother. To you we come, for you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not a petition, this bid in your clemency, hear and answer us. Amen. Amen. In the name Amen. of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, as Joe Basil rightfully said, we're here to talk about the story of the first Easter Bunny. This is Anthony's new book, Great Easter Book to Read. But I'm going to tell you why Anthony gets it. Because Anthony writes books for children. Christ said, unless we become like children, we will not enter the kingdom of heaven. But they're for everybody. And ultimately, what Jesus did was he planted a small seed. Even if you think about Jesus himself, three years, three years. And it's lasted for 2,000 plus years. His example, his life, a small seed. Anthony's stories are much broader than just the children's book itself. He's talking about larger ideas. That's why it's for everybody. And that's why you should go out and buy his books. Talk about planting that little seed. Because something I've learned, Anthony, in my time, I've been a, you know, a, a catechist for quite some time, but on the radio now for three years and doing social media for six, um, the best seeds are the small ones. The best seeds allow people to figure things out for themselves. You, you plant just enough. And then from there, it grows. They figure it out for themselves. And then they do what God intended them to do. Not what I want them to do, what God intended them to do. Talk about that because I think that's what you do. And that's why you're successful. Well, thank you very much. That's a tremendous uh, compliment. <laughs> you know, Jesus's parables uh, are the greatest uh, teaching model models to use, of course, for all of us. Um, why? Because young people can understand them. People with little education 
can understand them, but at the same time, they have depths uh, in them uh, that the greatest theologians and philosophers are still exploring today. Uh, they work on so many levels. And yes, I try to do that in all my children's books. I want kids to be able to get the main message uh, of the story from the stories in a powerful way, in a way that stays with them. But I also want the adults who are reading these books uh, to the kids to get something out of them too, because I'm keenly aware that that a lot of kids are having these books read to them by their parents, their grandparents, their older siblings, their aunts, their uncles. And not only are they having them read to them uh, once, but maybe 10 or 12 times. So you have this tremendous opportunity to evangelize everyone. Um, and so I'm trying to include uh, things that adults can, can, can uh, appreciate as well. I think that what you're saying is this, though, the greatest, deepest kinds of stories, Joe, are the ones that work on multiple levels. And they're also the ones that keep on giving. So that if you read a, um, a good book or see a great movie, you'll understand it and enjoy it the first time because of its simplicity. Uh, but as you grow older, as you go uh, further in life and you gain more and more life experiences, you'll be able to read the book or see the movie again and get even more from it. You know, the amount of meaning that you get from a great work of art depends on how much you bring to it. Now, in this particular story, I think, and we'll talk about what the story is about, but I think that children will be able to relate to, uh, in this particular book, a son's love for, for his mother. But I think that uh, they'll understand that even more when they grow older and they witness their mother growing through an illness, let's say, or even die. Then they'll be able to appreciate uh, the incredible message and promise of the resurrection, which this book is really about, the resurrection. So as you grow older, uh, you gain more insights. So the trick is to, to plant that seed and make it as simple as possible to but include enough in that seed so that it's going to grow with the, the child who's reading it. Uh, and eventually, hopefully, if, it's a, if it is a great work of art, it will, it will develop into a tree with many branches that could spread to all different areas of, her, of a person's life. Yeah, Anthony DiStefano is joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. Please go out and buy his book, The Story of the First Easter Bunny, that's available at Sophia Institute Press. You can click the link in the description so you will get a discount when you purchase it. I think that's so important, Anthony, that you say that because, um, you know, there are some people you could evangelize with talking about. Uh, you could talk about Aquinas and Augustine and get deep into philosophy. Most people are going to be moved, hopefully, to come into the church um, by good stories. You know, you tell them about some of Jesus's parables or as you're doing, let's say, writing a book like this. I saw you wanted to comment. Aunt. Go ahead. No, no, no. I, I you, you, about pictures, too, is very important for children. Uh, you mentioned, uh, you, you know, sometimes people ask me, why do you use fictional characters like the Easter Bunny or, or Star, let's say, uh, or a donkey that carries Jesus into Jerusalem? Why don't you just tell the Bible story to children? And uh, yes, we should tell children's stories straight from the Bible. We should introduce them to the Bible at a very early age, but we shouldn't forget the fact uh, that children love animals and find them adorable, whereas children often find adults intimidating because adults are bigger than they are. Uh, so when you're able to use animals as characters in books, uh, you bypass the intimidation stage immediately and kids are able to enter into a story without any difficulty. So in many ways, it's a lot easier to teach a child in particular about Jesus and the Gospels if you're able to come up with an animal character that can be beautifully illustrated with pictures uh, that are part of the story, or at least witnesses to the story. And that's what I did in this book. The bunny is actually a witness to the events of, of the Passion Week. Uh, so and that, that's the way I sort of Christianized and bapt baptized this Easter bunny. Well, let, let, let's let's stay on the Easter Bunny for a second, okay? So like everything else in our culture, Anthony, um, Easter is, uh, you know, gets, it gets overshadowed by commercialism, okay? Easter becomes about bunnies and chocolates and Easter egg hunts. And there's nothing wrong with that for kids, okay? I mean, I, I'm i assuming, you know, they could have some fun with that. But, the, but, but I guess my larger question is this. Was that a motivation in you writing a book? Writing this book? Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. I did write this book because I was tired of the commercialism connected with Easter. I think that that we have to be very careful about secular symbols like the Easter Bunny who come hopping in and taking uh, center stage on, on the most holy 
a Christian day of the whole year. I will say uh, what you just said, generally speaking, the church doesn't rigidly oppose the inclusion of secular symbols like the Easter bunny or Santa Claus and holiday celebrations. Uh, some Catholic parents even think that characters like that can be useful to some extent, again, because of what you said, because they could be used as vehicles to add a little extra excitement and fun to the holidays. And that could reinforce the deeper joyful meaning of the holidays. You know, you know, we want to make uh, these holidays memorable for children. We want them to associate Easter and Christmas with, hap with the happy feelings of childhood. And sometimes, sometimes, if you're careful, the addition of characters like Santa and the Easter Bunny can, can, can make things fun for kids. Uh, however, and this is a very, very big however, I think anyone serious about uh, their Christian faith would say that you have to be extremely cautious about this, um, you know, be, for the, be, be, because, because you only want these characters to serve as a kind of spice, never as the main course. You know, we need to be able to keep things in, pro in proper Christian perspective. And if parents are not able to walk that line, then it's better to do without those characters because we can't afford to lose sight of the, the deeper religious significance of our, our, our most holy days. And that's it. And I'm going to hand it over to Joe Anthony DeStefano, but that seems to be the, the way it's been in my my entire life. I mean, we're all around the same age. Um, you know, Christmas, I mean, if if my if my mother didn't drag me to church when I was a little kid on Christmas, okay, to, uh, Christmas would just be Santa Claus, Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer, uh, Frosty the Snowman, and that's it. Jesus who type thing. Right. So I'm I'm glad I'm glad you pointed it out. We have to we have to remember these are they like you said, they could be useful, they could be fun. But that's not what it's about. Anyway, Joe Resinello. Anthony, let's talk about the story of this book. You mentioned the bunny. You mentioned his mother. In the story, the bunny has very large ears, and he's seeking healing for his sick mother. Walk us through that. Well, one of the ways that we can make sure that we keep the emphasis on Jesus Christ during Easter without sacrificing some of the fun and playfulness that we were just talking about uh, offered by characters like the Easter Bunny is to adopt them for our own purposes. Uh, and in my book, as you said, the main character is a bunny who lives during biblical times. Uh, in Palestine, 2000 years ago, he actually witnesses the main events of the Passion Week. The last, he sees the Last Supper, the crucifixion, even the resurrection. Now, rabbits are famous for having large ears, of course. And I thought that this fact uh, lent itself perfectly to a very profound teaching of the Gospels, namely the necessity of having uh, ears to hear. Uh, throughout the whole Bible and in several passages in the New Testament, we read about the importance of listening. In Matthew and Mark uh, and other places, Jesus says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, in Christian theology, the phrase having ears to hear means something very different than simply hearing words. You know, it's about truly understanding those words and internalizing uh, their message. And as a result of that kind of attentive active listening, uh, people can bear much fruit in the kingdom of, Christ, of, of God. So in my children's book, the bunny's enormous ears are not just uh, physical attributes that rabbits have, but they equate to spiritual receptivity. And regarding the bunny's sick mother, you know, Joe, I wanted uh, there to be some kind of real connection between the bunny and Jesus. And since I've always had a very strong devotion to Our Lady, as, 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 as you both have, when I wrote this book, I immediately thought of the fact that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, the last direct action he took was to entrust his mother to St. John. He said, son, behold thy mother and mother, behold thy son. Now, of course, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, theological significance in this entrustment having to do with uh, uh, the church and Mary, who's the mother of the church. But beyond that deeper significance, it's also true that on a strictly literal personal level, uh, Jesus wanted to make sure that his mother that his mother would be okay after he died. And I thought that if the bunny in this book had a sick mother, and that if he witnessed the crucifixion and heard with his big rabbit ears how Jesus had taken care of his own mother, then that might provide him with an even more poignant reason for visiting Jesus's tomb afterwards and praying this line that I have in the book, which is, oh man in the tomb, please won't you be kind. You helped your dear mother, now won't you help mine? Uh, in other words, in other words, the fact that the bunny has a sick mother uh, whom he loves and is trying to care for makes it even easier for him to relate to Jesus 
who of course loved his own mother, Mary, better than any son could ever love his mother. That's the reason, reason I wrote the story in this way, because I think it has a strong emotional element to the book that most people can relate to. Anthony DeCefano is joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe, the story of the first Easter bunny. Please uh, click the link. If you're watching this on social media, click the link uh, in the description and buy it directly from the publisher. Anthony DeCefano, isn't that our problem in the modern world? We, we have eyes, we have ears, and we don't use them, quite frankly. I don't care how judgmental that sounds. Now, let me, let me, one caveat is for a good 20 years of my life, I didn't use them either. So I'm not pointing the finger at anybody else, but isn't that our issue? Is that we there's a, re, a refusal to open our ears to hear? Because if we did, maybe we wouldn't have so many problems in the world. Well, I I, I wouldn't be so uh, so hard on ourselves in that regard because you know, and it all comes down to to one uh, to one two words, the cult, uh, three words, the culture war. You know, uh, we can't be blind to the fact that there is an ongoing culture war in our society and our deepest beliefs are under con constant and relentless attack from the media and the entertainment industry. And uh, the secular world objects to, to religion and to religious beliefs. And so, of course, uh, you know, they'd rather that we be talking about chocolate bunnies and marshmallows and, and, and they want us to marginalize and compromise our, deep, our deepest beliefs. And they have a lot of tools at their disposal to help them, you know, very seductive tools uh, like the movies and the whole entertainment industry. So, so I think it's easy to be seduced. In other words, it's easy to be seduced. And it's, it's not just that we're, that we can't reduce it to just the fact that we're um, you know, uh, evil people or anything like that. We're weak and, uh, and, and, and we're facing an enemy that's very intelligent, very smart, very seductive, and it's easy for us to fall prey to that. Well, it, well, well that's why we're, we're blessed that, you know, Joe and I and you, because we could get out there into that breach, as we always say. It's not just a tagline on the show. And fight it in our own way. You by writing books, Joe and I by using our big mouths from, the, you know, a couple of Italian guys from New Jersey. But either way, if the message is the same, if underlying it all, what we're trying to emphasize is the need that, you know, not just as a nation, but also as individuals and families to live out gospel values, which is really, Anthony, what, you know, so many of your books. I mean, that's what they're infused with. Let's face it is is Catholic teaching and gospel values. All right. And, you know, the need to get the need to get back to that. Well, you know, in our own way, well, we're fight, might, might not look as good as a Hollywood movie. And I'm certainly not as handsome as Brad Pitt, okay? But nonetheless, Who said you know, that? We're, we're, we're still marching forward. <laughs> Who said that? I think you're much better looking than Brad Pitt. Joe Resinello. You know, I'll be honest. I didn't pick up on the enormous ears. I'm a little slow, Anthony, but I'm glad you said it. And I'll be truthful with you. Some of the most important things in the gospel, if we were going to, and, and you talked about that, is listening. When Our Lady says to the folks at the wedding of Cana, Listen to him. If I was going to pick maybe five things in the whole entire Bible, that might be in the top five, that one phrase, listen to him. But why don't we? Mother Teresa said, I take Jesus at his word. She said the whole gospel can be broken down into looking at one's hand. You did it to me. The whole gospel on the five fingers. Um, Jesus says a lot. And sometimes we just don't hear it. St. Paul says we hear what our itchy ears want to hear. And I think a lot of people, that's how we, we roll. But let's get to the question of why. And I've talked about this again through my years as being a catechist. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see the face of God. It has everything to do with our heart. The closer our hearts get to our Lord, the more we will see and hear. That's why Our Lady was the perfect instrument, because her heart was so pure, and she heard and saw everything. We, on the other hand, don't. But how do we do that? Prayer, fasting, sacramental life. It's Lent. This is how we do it. We should do it all the time, actually, not just in Lent. Talk about that, because I'll be honest with you, the purer our hearts get, and they can become much purer than they already are because we're all flawed. The more we will see and hear to take Jesus at his word, at his word. And that's within the grasp of all people and children, especially because they have very pure hearts and they are receptive to everything. Talk about that because we can do that. And if we do that, we'll see and hear more. 
Yes, uh, and you're absolutely right. And the bottom line is, I think we have to all up our spiritual game here. Uh, we have to go to mass more. We have to do something that you and I were talking about before the program started, which is we have to go to Eucharistic adoration more and we have to increase our prayer and, and fasting. Fasting especially is something that's uh, overlooked uh, a lot. Uh, the church asks us to focus on fasting during Lent for a reason. Fasting is defined as abstaining from food or drink for certain periods of time. And, and, and we do that during Lent, but fasting can be much broader than that. You can fast from any activity, like going on social media uh, or watching TV or, or listening to music or shopping or gossiping. You know, and those acts of self-denial can be very, very beneficial in developing your ability to hear the word of God. It can be very beneficial in, in developing your willpower. It's all about the will. It's all about the will. What you have to understand is that, you know, that so many problems are, that we have in our life are the result of our weakened will. And we were just speaking about this earlier too. Over the years, our will has lost much of its power uh, because the world and all its glittering attractions, all its noisy attractions has been working hard to erode our will through advertising and through Hollywood tempting us all the time. But when you fast, you say no to the world. You say no to instant gratification. You say no to your body. You say no to your emotions. You say no to your whole psychology. You completely interrupt your usual self-indulgent way of interacting with the world. And it's this radical pattern interrupt that can have a transformational effect on your life. When you say no to eating, it, it does something to your body by purifying it. It does something to your will by strengthening it. It does something to your brain by teaching you that you do have self-control. It does something to your soul by acting as a form of penance and uh, for bad behavior and a form of preparation for better behavior in the future. So fasting has a purifying and nourishing effect on our souls and bodies. How in the, think about it, how in the world can you hope to follow uh, the moral teachings of Jesus Christ in this secular, hedonistic, noisy, morally upside down age that we're living in without ever getting any spiritual nourishment from Jesus Christ? And how can you even think of mustering enough courage uh, to take part in the, the great spiritual culture war that's raging around us today when we don't even have the most important spiritual weapon at our disposal, that we're not even using those spiritual uh, weapons at our disposal, like the Eucharist and, 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 and fasting. Uh, it's like trying to defeat an enemy with both hands tied behind your back. Uh, to quote G.K. Chesterton, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. That's the point. So in order to do battle with all these things you're talking about, you've got to up your spiritual game. Go to Mass more, go to Eucharistic ad adoration, and, and, and practice uh, mortification and fasting and prayer more often. So, Anthony, let me ask you this. So, and it, obviously, this parallels what, what you mentioned the, the the culture war, the spiritual battle that we're in. The bunny himself is on a journey, and things seem very, very dark at some point. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. Um, but he takes refuge in Christ's words. Um, Talk about that a little bit, because I, I'm glad you mentioned courage, Andy, because that seems to be the way it is. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And you need to say, as you said, with the tools that the church gives us, that Christ gave, gave us himself, okay, gave to the church. Yes, you can. Go ahead, Ant. Well, look, this is a big topic, and, and we should talk about it, because, you know, C.S. Lewis said that courage is the most important virtue of all of them, because it's the form of every virtue at its testing point. In other words, you need to be brave to, to overcome powerful temptations. You can, be, you can be chased until you're really sexually tempted. Then you need courage to go through that period of temptation without sinning. You can be charitable until someone really annoys you and uh, hurts you. And then you need courage to be calm without losing your temper. You need courage for everything. I personally think uh, and I and my brother is a priest, and I've asked him, uh, you know, about what he hears, uh, not specifically what he hears in confession, but in general what he hears from people out there. And 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 he agrees. The biggest problem in our life is that we're afraid. We're we're afraid of so many things. We're afraid for our health. 
Uh, we're afraid for our families. We're afraid for our marriages. We're afraid for our children. Uh, we're afraid for our jobs and our finances. Um, our biggest fear, of course, is that we're not enough to overcome all our problems, that we don't have what it takes. You know, I don't care if you're the president of the United States or, or, or an Olympic athlete or a parent or a prisoner, we all feel as though we're not competent enough or smart enough or strong enough or athletic enough or humorous enough or beautiful enough to deal with all our problems. And if, and if we're not afraid of those things, if you're some sort of super person and you're not afraid of those things, then there's another fear you have to contend with that everyone has or mostly everyone has, the fear that we're not going to be loved. And that's a great, great fear. And, and children, since this is a children's book, we have to talk about the fear they experience. They're afraid of so many things. Imagine if you were small and everything looked big to you. All the experiences we adults treat as uh, common are totally new to children. You know, doctor's appointments, dentist appointments, the first day of school, moving into a new neighborhood, uh, the death of a pet, the death of a grandparent. Any of those kinds of big changes are, are, are terrifying to children. So the bottom line is, that we start out when we're very young being afraid of things and the fear never really lets up. It only intensifies, intensifies as we grow older and, and have more serious things to be afraid of. And yet, and here's the big caveat, and yet the Bible says over a hundred times that we shouldn't be afraid. Be not afraid. All through the Bible we see that, not just Jesus. Now, how can that be? The answer's got to be, that God has a plan, God is in charge, and we need to trust him. That's what it comes down to. The Bible says fear is useless. What is needed is trust. Trust uh, in God's will is the most important lesson anyone can learn in life. God is already in the future. He knows what's best for us. It's weak. We don't even know what's gonna happen to us tomorrow. So what's important is that we understand that God has a bigger plan, uh, and that uh, he wants what's best for us. So, so now that's very hard to do to trust God. But if you keep trying to, to trust him and strengthen your courage like a muscle, it will, it will, it will grow. And so that's, that's, that's the reason why it's so hard to, to, to practice courage on a daily basis. Let's take a quick break here at the front line with Joe and Joe. You're listening to us on the Veritas Catholic Radio Network. We're uh, always pleased and honored to be joined by our friend Anthony Stefano. We're discussing his new book, The Story of the First Easter Bunny. Now, you can click the link in the description if you're uh, watching or listening to this on social media. Um, that will bring you directly to the publisher, Sophia Press. You could purchase the book there. We also would encourage you to look through all of Anthony's books. Some are for adults, some are for kids, some are for both. But there's a treasure trove of books you could read. But today, we're talking about the story of the first Easter Bunny. So stick around, and we have another great segment with Anthony. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone, to the front line with Joe and Joe. Joe Pasillo and Joe Resinello. We are way in the breach with our friend Anthony DiStefano. We're discussing his new book, The Story of the First Easter Bunny, that's available at Sophia Institute Press. Click the link in the description, um, and we'll take you directly to the site, and you'll get a discount for purchasing the book there. Joe Resinello, where do you want to go? Anthony, I want to talk about fear a little more because it's so important. You did a great job in breaking that down. Um, fear is a tool of the devil. Uh, your, your brother's a priest. And I think so many of us have so many great ideas, but we're afraid, we're afraid, we're afraid. And the devil uses that. A lot of what you were talking about comes down to putting on the armor of God. It's normal to be afraid. We're human. Um, but when we put on the armor of God, what does that mean? We live in a state of grace. We go to sacramental confessions. We receive the Eucharist, which is viaticum, food for the journey. It's Jesus himself who comes into our soul when our, when our soul is in a state of grace. It gives us grace. It comes, up, about, it comes down to grace. We live on a supernatural level when we live in a state of grace. People say, what are you talking about? No, no, you live in a supernatural way when you live in the state of grace. And that helps us to conquer fear. I wanted to say that, but I also want to say this, and I'm interested in your thoughts. Getting out of the boat. Christ tells Peter, get out of the boat. When we do that little by little, we start to understand that God is with us. It's it's very hard to just jump off, you know, the, the three foot, you know, the diving board. But little by little, when we 
get out into that water. You know, we start to realize, you know, God's with me here. He's with me. I didn't think I could do that. But wow, I did it. He's real. God's real. And then you start really jumping off the diving board. Talk about that because I don't think, you know, people talk about providence. They talk about this, but they're afraid. You got to little by little and it grows and your courage grows. And before you know it, you're doing things you couldn't believe. Yes, yes. This is a very big principle, not only in spirituality, but in life in general. The Bible says, uh, do not despise small beginnings. And of course, you know, uh, Confucius said, you know, the, uh, even a, a million mile uh, journey begins with one step. So this is something that's wired into our human nature. Uh, if you just look at all your problems and all your fears, you will be overwhelmed. And what, that, what will happen is when you're overwhelmed, you will be paralyzed. You won't be able to move. And that's what the devil wants you to do. You know, th th this is why the, the, the mass says that after sin, uh, the greatest evil is anxiety. It says protect, the mass says protect us from all anxiety. Why? Because when you have anxiety, when you are stressing about things, you become paralyzed and you can't do anything. You, you're not able to do the good the good, you're not able to love as much as you are called to love. So it's it saps you of all your energy and you can't be an effective Christian and you can't live in the kingdom of heaven the way Christ calls us to live. So how do you break this pattern of being overwhelmed? And the way to do it is just what you advise. Start small, start small, take a small step. You don't have to Look, you, you, all your problems in your finances, let's say, or all your problems in your marriage, or all your problems in your health, didn't take one day to, to it didn't take one day to get that way. And it's not going to take one day for you to cure all those problems. Take that small step first, the smallest step. It doesn't have to be a big step, a small step. And But if you do that, and you do that consistently over a period of days and weeks, then you will start picking up momentum. This is real. It's a principle from physics. An object at rest stays at rest, but an object in motion will stay in motion. Uh, I, I happen to be a pilot, by the way. I, I fly planes. Uh, I've, I've, I've had a pilot's license since I was 19 years old. Fly little planes. But, you know, when I'm in that plane and I'm on the runway and uh, air traffic control, the tower tells me clear for takeoff, I press the throttle all the way. And guess what? That plane moves very, very slow at first. In fact, it's moving so slow that a child could outrun that plane. But what happens after a few minutes of rolling? It's go it starts going faster and faster and faster. And pretty soon you achieve takeoff and you're flying somewhere. That's exactly the way it is with people out there who are stuck in ruts. If you want to get out of any kind of rut, Start small. Pick a few practical steps. If your if your life is messed up, if uh, then 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 start by cleaning your desk. C clear off your desk today, or or clean your computer screen today. Do something easy. Something easy. Don't, and then tomorrow do something else. And then the day after do something else. And believe it or not, in within two weeks you're going to be on fire. And this look, it, it applies to working out as well. If you're in bad shape. That first trip to the gym is horrible. It's hard to do that. You don't want to go to the gym. The second day is a little bit easier. The third trip is easier still. After three or four weeks of working out, then you've got so much momentum, nobody could stop you from going. Even if there was a blizzard outside, a snowstorm, you're going to get in that car and go to the gym because you're taking advantage of the principle of momentum. And it works in the spiritual life every bit as it, as it, as it works uh, in our daily lives. I'm glad you mentioned about getting stuck in a rut. I think that's exactly what happens to a lot of people. And the the the, the way you describe it is being paralyzed. If it, you know, it's very not only is it very easy to stay there, but then, like you said, then it gets increasingly more. Like you talk about, it gets increasingly easier to when you get back to the gym when you when you bite the bullet and you you get back to the gym. Then it becomes increasingly easier to just fall further and further into that rut. I think it's where it's where a lot of people end up, unfortunately. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm glad, go ahead, Ant. I want, I, you know, I want to say one, one thing else also that doesn't really have to do with this book so much, but it's a, it's a, it's a strategy of the devil. Uh, and it has to do with this point of feeling overwhelmed. You know, the devil is smart. He could read the Bible too. He knows that when it comes to getting to heaven, 
God has put the bar very low. He's done all the hard work of redemption by dying on the cross. We just have to be sorry. If we're sorry in faith and we try to turn around, God's going to forgive us no matter what we've done. One drop of Christ's blood is enough to wash away the sins of a billion universes. So the devil has seen a lot of He's, he's sat and, and watched by, uh, as, as, as millions and millions of people over the year have had deathbed confessions and have ruined all his years of hard work. He knows that forgiveness is easy. So he's got a very simple strategy. The strategy is to get us not to be sorry for our sins. Because if we're not sorry for our sins, we can't be forgiven. So how does he do that? One of the ways is by making us into atheists. If he makes us into atheists, well, then we're not going to be sorry because we have no one to apologize to. We have no one to be sorry uh, to. Uh, another way he does it is to make us into relativists. Uh, then we believe that, you know, who's to say what's right and wrong? So we're not sorry for our sins because we don't think that there's sins in the, in the first place. But in the, 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 the way that he really loves to, to, to work on us, I believe, is to tempt us so many times. To, to make us continue uh, sinning in the same way, time after time, after falling time and time again, that we be begin to despair. We, we, we might believe in God and we might believe that we've sinned, but what we say to ourselves is, there's no hope. There's no hope. I'm never going to change. God's never going to forgive me. He, and so they don't even bother saying they're sorry. They just give in to this despair and then checkmate. He's got you again. So, yeah. so again, for the people out there who are, who's, who are, whose problems are not maybe the fact that their finances are screwed up or their, or their, or their lives are messed up in general. It's just that they keep sinning and they can't help themselves. Remember that's a trick of the devil. Uh, and, and the way to get out of it is again, to utilize this principle of momentum, go to the blessed sacrament. It doesn't matter. Even if you haven't gone to confession, go to the blessed sacrament, sit, sit in front of Jesus for 10 minutes and leave. Go to church, do something, say one Hail Mary, just one. You don't have to say the whole rosary. Just start and do it a little bit every day. And by the week two or week three, you're going to be wanting to go to confession and you're going to be wanting to rectify your life. So never give in to despair. And remember what I just said, one drop of Christ's blood is enough to wash away the sins of a billion universes. There is nothing that you can do that God hasn't seen people do for thousands and thousands of years. So don't despair. Anthony, let me say this, and I'm going to hand it over to Joe. I think uh, to put just expand on it a little bit more from my own experience, you start to think that a thing, call it a particular sin, whatever it might be, you can't imagine your life without that thing. And that is, and again, I speak from personal experience, that is a really, really bad place to be. Um, and I, I thank God. I, I pray more prayers of gratitude than I do for any other intention, because in my life, Thank God it was years ago, um, but that's the way I was. Couldn't imagine my life actually trying, and it, trying as best I can, to live for Christ, to live in now for my family, for my wife, my son, rather than living selfishly. And I think that's the rut that a lot of people get caught up in, and I'm glad you, I'm glad you spoke to that. Joe Resinello. Anthony, we're talking about Easter, and your book is about Easter, but we have to also talk about Lent, because Lent brings us to Easter. Now, in life, if you talk to successful people, whether they're Catholic or not, there's certain traits that successful people have. One of them is self-discipline. You cannot be successful, Catholic or not, without self-discipline. Why do I bring that up? Because Lent teaches you that. And as a Catholic, over the years, when you take practices during the Lenten period and take Lent seriously, not just like give up potato chips, which is okay, you know, potato chips, I like potato chips, but you really take Lent seriously. That doesn't mean you beat yourself up, you don't like uh, whip yourself at night, but you take it seriously. You develop self-discipline. That can help you in this life. Not only does it draw you closer to God, which is also the ultimate goal. Talk about taking Lent seriously also from a psychological perspective it's proven 40 days when you get into a behavior say you have a bad practice whatever it is you curse and you really work on that you get into that behavior then it carries forth 
after the 40 day period. That's the name of the game. That's what Lent's all about. Drawing us closer to God. Talk about taking it seriously. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I think we've touched on some of the ways to take it seriously already by upping your spiritual game, uh, by going to Eucharistic adoration, by going to mass more, by praying and fasting more. I think what, what you need to do though, in order to take something seriously is to come up with a plan. That's the thing. If you don't have a plan, if you don't have a strategy, if you're just going to go into Lent, la-di-da, and just go wherever your spirit takes you, wherever your will takes you, you have a weakened will to begin with. Remember, that's one of the problems. And so you're just going to fail. So I think the idea is coming up with a plan, any kind of plan, uh, even going so far as to write it down and say, okay, I'm going to go to mass. Instead of just Sundays, I'm going to go to mass one other time per week. Uh, I'm going to try to visit the Blessed Sacrament once a week or once every other week. Uh, I'm going to try to say a rosary a week. Or if you're already saying the rosary, well, then a rosary every day. Or if you're already saying a rosary every day, then say four rosaries uh, a day or two rosaries a day. Some uh, effort uh, needs to be taken in, in, in making a battle plan. We're in a war. That's what it comes. We're in a war with the devil and, uh, and, and with, the, with, the, with the secular culture. And if you're in a war, then you need a plan. Imagine during World War II, when we were fighting the Nazis, if we didn't have a plan, if we didn't have a D-Day invasion operation, uh, uh, if we didn't have all the troops landing here and, and going this direction and that direction, fighting this battle and that battle and sending the fleet over here, we had a, a battle plan. And that's why we were able to achieve victory. Uh, without a plan, you're going to be lost. So make a plan to up your spiritual game. And even though Lent has started and we're a couple of weeks into it, doesn't matter. Get out your pencil and paper or your or your smartphone. Write down a couple of things that you simple, small things. They don't have to be huge. A couple of things that you're going to do for the remaining weeks of Lent. God is going to reward that kind of planning because that's a sign that you're taking things seriously. And that should make sense to people, Anthony, because bottom line is nobody does or nobody should. Most people don't do anything without some kind of a plan. Um, I mean, if somebody wants to open a business, well, you don't just say, hey, let me go just go. I, I, I'm just going to go start a business. No, you have to sit down. You got to write a plan. It takes time. You have to figure out how you're going to do things, put pieces in place. But, you know, you have to have a plan and obviously a goal. Now, the goal in this case, obviously, is to be drawn closer to Christ come Easter Sunday. Go ahead, Ant. Yeah, yeah. If you, you know, uh, the goal thing is very important. If you, how are you going to hit a target if you don't have a bullseye? How are you going to hit a target if you don't have a bullseye? You got to do that. And what you said too, you know, makes me think about people who, who, um, who say they believe in God, but they don't believe in organized religion. I mean, aren't you tired of hearing about those people? They believe in God, but they don't believe in organized religion. Think of the irony of, of, that, of that statement. When it comes to every important area of life, there needs to be some level of organization. All right, if you needed surgery, what if you went to the doctor and the doctor said, well, you know, I really love, I love uh, cutting people open, but I haven't studied many, many textbooks and I never got my degree and I don't know too much about anatomy, but I just, I just feel wonderful about surgery. Or if you wanted to start a business. And someone said, well, you know, I don't I don't have a business plan. I don't have a budget. I don't have anything. But give me all your money. I just have a, a really strong feeling about what I'm going to do in this situation. You know, in every area of life that's important, including including relationships, there has to be some level of organization, some kind of plan, some kind of knowledge in order for you to really uh, be outstanding in it and achieve your goals. And, and, and it's, it's no less important. It's even more important when it comes to the biggest areas in life, like your spirituality. Of course, Absolutely. In other words, of course it's, really, it's important to have, the most important thing is to have a personal relationship with, with the Lord. But like a personal relationship you have with your wife and a successful marriage, you have to have a lot of different rules, unwritten rules and ideas about the parameters and the, uh, uh, that are that are uh, that govern all those situations regard, regarding child rearing and and uh, and all those things related to marriage. Anyway, I'm 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 going running off too much on this subject, but it's that's important. that's all right. We do it all. We do it all the time, Ant. Uh, you've been here before. You know that uh, Anthony DiStefano is joining us here at the front line with Joe and Joe. The story of the first 
Easter Bunny. Now, please click the link in the description and go to Sophia Institute Press, buy the book, and look at all of Anthony's other books while you're there, too. You're probably going to want to purchase one or more of those also. Joe Resinello. Anthony, America has never been a Catholic nation. Immigrants brought Catholicism to America, like our families. We were from Italy. They came here. It's You know, it was a Catholic nation. To a large degree, it still is. And they came here and they brought the faith. Um, why do I bring that up? Because, and I'm not picking on Protestants. I love Protestants. I love everybody, actually. Um, but they have a way to sanitize the resurrection. Notice, if you go into a Protestant church, there is no corpus on the cross. It's just you mean the, the crucifixion, Joe? Cor uh, well, the resurrection. Yes, correct. My bad. My bad. Thank you. They they sanitize it. And then if you go to South America, it's completely different. You see the body of Christ beaten, bloody. Um, I think it's important not to sanitize the crucifixion um, because ultimately there is no resurrection without the crucifixion. Talk about that because I think Americanism has this way because we are a Protestant nation and Protestants have this way, like the idea of the rapture. Like, oh, you're just going right up to heaven. You're going right up. He's going to suck you right up. Okay. I, I wish it was so easy, um, but I don't think that's how it's going to roll. Talk about that. Well, yes. And we could talk about this from a point of view of Protestant versus Catholic because you know, in many ways, um, what Catholics have is is something that many Protestants don't have, which is balance. And not just when it comes to looking at the the hard things like the crucifixion, but also the joyful things. You know, many uh, sects in Protestantism over the years, like, for instance, the Puritans, uh, didn't have any kind of joy. All they did was look at the dark side of things. They didn't know how to, they thought that if you had any kind of enjoyment in your life, uh, a little wine with your dinner, or and some Protestants today still think this, then you're indulging in some sort of sinful behavior. The, the, the great blessing of being a Catholic is that you have a balance of everything. It's the, it's the full rounded picture. Uh, like a human being, you should be well-rounded. Our, our religion is, is well-rounded. Um, but I wanna say something else about America here, and it doesn't really have to do with the religion. I think that in many ways uh, today, we've gotten used to a sanitized and even artificial life. And, and, and think about it, just social media, uh, on, on, on Facebook or Instagram uh, or Twitter or Snapchat or TikTok or YouTube, on all these different platforms, we put out these sanitized, photoshopped, edited versions of ourselves and our lives. And uh, so we can appear, why? Happier, uh, richer, more successful, better looking than we actually are. You know, and, 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 and we try to achieve uh, something similar through all the cable TV shows that we binge watch or even the video games that we play or the amount of time that we spend on the smartphones and tablets. You know, even when we watch scary movies or, or play violent video games, it's not real. The danger is all uh, gratuitous. You know, we live uh, in the safety of our living rooms when we do all this. We're, 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 it, it's not just the content and, and the devices themselves. We, we're just becoming immersed and engulfed in a technology uh, that we totally control. And it's all artificial. It's all pretend. It has very little to do with real life, with real suffering, with real moral choices, with real testing and strengthening of our wills, with real consequences of real actions. So of course, when you get used to that kind of artificial living, your will gets soft because it's so accustomed to making pretend choices uh, that have no effect. So not only does that weaken us spiritually, mentally, emotionally, uh, physically, uh, psychologically, but we then tend to shy away from anything that's, that's real. And that's really the answer to your question because the most real thing in the whole history of the world is the death of Jesus Christ, the murder of God. That's what made the resurrection uh, and our own resurrection possible. And I'm not just talking in terms of life after death. I'm talking about rising out of the miserable circumstances of our own lives. There's a lack of willingness today to do the hard things, uh, to, the, to, to make the sacrifices that are required uh, to get out of debt, let's say, uh, or to rectify our family lives or to get healthy and so on. Uh, the current generation does feel entitled to everything, and, it's, it, and it is not willing to make the necessary sacrifices in order to rise above their circumstances. And I think that's all tied in uh, with the unwillingness to face the fact 
of what you just said before, that crucifixion is necessary before resurrection. You have to be willing to pay the price in order to achieve success or victory in any endeavor in life. Are you willing to pay the price? It doesn't seem to me that the current generation in America is ready to do that. The crucifixion is about the price, and that's why we avoid it. That's why we sanitize it. I, Joe, I, let me I just think, talk about that for ahead, one please, second, because we have to die to ourselves. You talk about, you know, basically crucifixion, but ultimately, what I have found is when we come to the end of ourselves. Uh, we recently talked to Joe McGivney, who was an alcoholic. Uh, he's actually related to Michael McGivney, who founded the Knights of Columbus, and he came to the end of himself. And then he found God many times. That's how it works. But in order to really fill ourselves with the Holy Spirit, we have to die to ourselves. I've said this in uh, RCIA class many times. Even God, you mentioned physics. If you have a glass of water and it's full to the brim. Physics say you can't pour milk into that. Even God can't do that. What do you have to do? You have to dump the water out and then you could pour milk to the very top. Well, that's how it works. The more we empty ourselves and prepare the cup, which is our soul, God fills it. But when we're full of ourselves and we don't live a sacrificial life in whatever vocation we're in, God cannot fill us. We repel him. Talk about that, dying to self, because we all are called to the cross, one way or another. I'm not going to get nailed to one. I might. I live in New Jersey. It could happen, but it's probably not going to happen. What's going to happen, though, is I have to die to myself through my wife and children, white martyrdom. I pray that every day. May I embrace everything that you give me. And I don't always do that well, but I try. Talk about that. You know, I, you know, Joe, I can't say it more articulately and beautifully than you just said it. You, 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 you not only hit the hell in the head, but you said it so beautifully. You have to lose yourself in order to find yourself. You have to die in order to rise again. Uh, St. Augustine said that, you know, in, if you want to be given something to hold by God, you have to drop what you have and approach him with empty arms. You know, uh, even even Jesus on the cross, you know, everything God did, he did for a reason. Even the, the way that he chose to die is full of symbolism. That cross, his arms are extended. He's holding nothing. That's the way we have to be when we approach God. We have to be empty, open. God emptied himself, the, the Bible says, to become one of us. So this theme of emptying ourselves so that God could fill us up with grace. You know, you know, the thing is though, that we should, we should understand is that when he fills us up, when he gives us, when we die to ourselves and he gives us back a new self, the Bible says, I will make things, all things new again. He doesn't give us back something different. He gives us back our, our own self, our own soul, but, but we, he, he actualizes all our potential. We're not losing anything. We're gaining who we truly are. And this is the big distinction uh, between uh, Christianity and, say, the Eastern re religions of Buddha Buddhism. You know, in, in those religions, sometimes they seem similar to us because they talk about the importance of self-renunciation and sacrifice. But they're actually very different because it's for totally different motives. In Buddhism, you say, well, we have to renounce ourselves and uh, renounce the world and, and, and all of that uh, because, because the world is bad, because, uh, the world, because we're bad, because the greatest good in Buddhism uh, is to achieve nirvana, which is nothingness. For us, the reason why we renounce ourselves, we renounce our lives, why we give up things for Lent, why we give up things, it is not because those things are bad, which Buddhism teaches. It's because they're good. They're so good that we want to sacrifice them for, the, for God. And we want to be able to, to God to, to give us back something even better in return. So we're not giving anything up. We're exchanging something lower for something higher. We're exchanging for something. My brother Salvatore is a priest. He gave up being married and having a family. But did he give it up? 
Or did he just exchange something perhaps lower for something higher? Because now he's got thousands and thousands of spiritual children and a spiritual family. And he's married to the bride of Christ, the church. So, so he didn't lose anything. God gave him something better. And so when we empty ourselves, as you said before, that beautiful analogy of the cup, God fills us back up with something even greater so we can live uh, so, so that it's the whole reason, you know, he died on the cross so that he died. So our human natures could die so that we can live on a higher level, that we could live on God's level. That's what the crucifixion and resurrection are all about and what grace is about. So we can live on a higher God, God level. We can live up there. And that's why the book of Revelation says that we will be on the thrones with God. So because we've exchanged our lower type of life for God's higher kind of life. That's know. a great place. To, that's a great yeah. place to end, uh, end it. Anthony DiStefano, uh, the book, please, everybody out there listening to us, the story of the first Easter bunny that's available at Sophia Institute Press. You could click the link in the description. It'll take you right to the website. You'll buy it with a discount because of Joe and Joe. And look at all of Anthony's books there. We're sure where you're going to love, uh, be interested in, in, in one or more of those books too. Anthony DiStefano, as always, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it, brother. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure and an honor to be with you guys. Thanks, Ant. And thank you all out there at the Veritas Catholic Radio Network, 1350 on your AM dial, 103.9 on your FM dial, spreading the truth of the Catholic faith to the New York City metropolitan area. Download the app, share it with your friends, and wherever you see Joe and I on social media, please like, subscribe, share, do all that fun stuff. Help us out a little bit. And remember, until the next time, that our conversation is your conversation, and that conversation is going on everywhere. We'll talk to you soon.